know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here is your host, Reverend Jeff Peterson. Today, our stewardship emphasis is on generosity. What a beautiful word, generosity, knowing generous people. Now, I remember as being a young boy growing up in my hometown that there was the grade school where there was a big play area and my friends, we would gather to play football, baseball, or whatever season it was in that big play area, that field. But across the street was a filling station, a full service filling station, and that, that's the way it used to be back in the, the 60s and early 70s, is that you'd have the filling station, they would have gasoline, the mechanic working in the garage, and then there's also a place where they would sell you know, automotive uh, parts and things that we would need, but then there's also pop and candy. And so that, at that age, that was my interest, and so as we would as I would be taking a break from playing the game, I'd go across the street and go to the filling station where they had a pop machine and also a candy bar machine. And I'd go there often and I'd get my can of pop or get my candy bar. But I remember one time I put my money in for the candy bar machine and and I remember the candy bar, it was the $100,000 candy bar. And I remember pulling, at that time you would pull a lever and the candy bar would come down, but I remember the lever, as I pulled it, I mean, not only did one candy bar come down, but there were a few other candy bars that came down with it. And then I pulled it again without putting money in and more candy bars came down. I felt like I had hit the jackpot. I had all of these $100,000 candy bars. And so at that age, I really did feel like I hit the $100,000 jackpot. Well, as I went back out into the field with all of these candy bars, and I was showing my friends for which my brother was in the crowd, my older brother, he was part, part of the group, thinking, well, here, I've got candy bars to share, and I'll have a lot of candy bars for, well, who knows how long. And my brother just simply looked at me saying, you take those candy bars back. They do not belong to you. And I said, well, hey, the candy bar machine just continued to, you know, to, to give them back it's, or, or, or to, or to um, release them you know, to where I got all of these. I just felt like it was a generous candy bar machine that day. Well, that day I learned a lesson. Just because the candy bar machine was broken doesn't mean that I was entitled to as many candy bars as it was willing to distribute to me that day. And so I went back in and the guy who had the filling station, a very nice man, and I just said, uh, the candy bar machine is broken, here are all these candy bars. He kind of had a smile on his face, he took them all back, and all was good. But another time I went across the street and I went to the same filling station and I put my, at that time, you could get a can of pop for a quarter. I put my quarter in, and I pressed the little button, to, you know, as far as the, my selection of the type of soda pop I wanted. Nothing. I pressed it again, I pressed it again. You know, then you got the change uh, lever there, and I was having that going back and forth, and I thought, oh, my quarter is gone. Now, here again, back in the late 60s, early 70s, whenever this was, for a young grade school kid, a quarter was a lot of money. And so it was like, hey, <laughs> this pop machine has stolen my quarter. And so I went into, once again, the same man, and I just simply said, you know, I put my quarter in the machine, and I, and I didn't get my, my can of pop, and he was so good-natured, he just went and got me another quarter and made sure that it worked and I, I got my can of pop and I was now happy. But I think so much of this in life, this has to do a lot with, with greed. Greed in life when sometimes we feel like we've been ripped off and other times when we think, hey, this has been 
my lucky day. I put in, I, I put in a dime into the candy bar machine, and here again I'm dating myself. That's how much a candy bar cost back then. And here I got, you know, a whole bundle full of candy bars. And so I think that's you know kind of a lot of what we can hear the complaining about today. You hear the complaining about either I've been ripped off, or boy, look at me, I'm the lucky guy today. Everybody's envious of me. I put in a minimal effort and I got a maximum output. But still, this is the nature of greed. And that's why I find gambling to be a moral, ethical issue. That I can go into a place and I can take my hard-earned money only to have a machine get it all. And I don't think that I can go to the manager of the casino like I can at the gas station and say, hey, I put all my money in this machine and I didn't get anything back. I was wondering if you could reimburse me. Oh, that's not going to happen. But on the other hand, if I go and put a nickel into or a quarter into a machine, and all of a sudden I'm getting thousands of dollars, thinking, well, this is my lucky day, I'd be taking all that money but still feeling like well, there's something that's not right about this. But somehow I'm receiving all this money that really does not belong to me. Greed. And that's part of our human nature. Probably one of those seven deadly sins. And that's why I've never got into gambling, because I, knew, I know that if I did, it would be a problem for me. And not only that, but I'll just continue to just develop this ravenish desire and the spirit of greed. That's not going to be good for me, and it's not going to be good for those who are around me. And so when we think about generosity, greed would be the flip side of that. And here again, it's our human nature that we struggle with, our human nature versus our nature with God, that God is calling us to be generous people, while in our nature there's, boy, I, <laughs> there's that greed. I could always use a little bit more. And that's the thing, that's the lie, is a little bit more is never good enough. I always think, if I could just have this one more thing, then I'll be satisfied. If I get this one more thing, and it's not long before I'm thinking, oh, if I could just have this one more little thing, then I'll be satisfied. And we wonder, well, just how far does that go? Jesus says, what would it profit a person to gain the whole world and fall short of the glory of God? When Jesus says that I am the bread of life, he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst again, meaning that you're fully satisfied in me. But he's saying that I'm the one who satisfies you. This one more thing isn't going to do it. Because that one more thing will lead to another more thing, and until finally, if we continue on long enough, or depending upon who we are and what our abilities are, we will gain the whole world, but we still will not be satisfied. And that's the thing, that there's only one thing that can satisfy our soul, and that is God. And so that is the basis, and that's the one thing that can transform our hearts from being greedy to generous, is the Holy Spirit that is working within us. You know, the design of society is this. It's kind of like, have you ever played Monopoly? You got the Monopoly board? That's kind of a good game to learn. You know, it's a good economics game. You got properties, and as you begin the game, you know, some of the properties are of lesser value, some are of great value, and then you got those properties that are in between. So the game just initially just shows the way that it's set up is that you've got the higher class, you've got the middle class, and you've got the lower class. And so as we begin playing the game, it seems like everything is, is fine. Everybody seems to be playing. Everybody is buying a certain amount of property and, and once in a while able to build a house on the property. And it seems like everybody is able to play on the board. 
But eventually we see that something's happening. It's getting harder for people to play on the board, especially those with uh, lesser properties. Or sometimes with the larger properties that they're not managing their money or if they went out and spent everything on hotels and then got trapped in the meantime before anybody landed on their property. And I'm talking about board, boardwalk in Park Place. That sometimes the person who's got some of the lesser valued property can actually win out. So there's strategy in that. But that's the nature of economics. That if people are not generous in their hearts, and if they've got this desire for got greed in their hearts, then that's what's going to happen is that they will eventually consume the board. And if there is no monitoring of it, no regulating of it. And so that's the way that it is in life. You know, I hear lots of arguments, communism, socialism, capitalism. <clears throat> but the thing that I've noticed about all of these systems is that if things aren't regulated to a degree, the wealthy will have everything eventually. And that's what we're seeing now in our world. I go to Russia, where it's a communist country. Well, people can debate that now. I think we've got modern communism there. Basically, yeah, it's kind of run by those same principles that, that the wealthy have just about everything. And, and your average person who's just trying to make a living is really struggling. Trust me, I've been there, and I've been in amongst their people. But then we look at a capitalistic society like what we have, and we kind of see the same thing happening. A lot of people are not happy. They work hard, and, and they're really struggling to make ends meet, really struggling to, to make a living and putting food on their kids' tables and, and things like that. And that more and more, uh, it's, it's ending up in the hands of a few. And so that's, you know, a lot of what we are looking at here is, you know, just uh, the ethical issues of, you know, as far as greed versus generosity. Now here again, that doesn't mean that somebody who is wealthy, that they are evil. As a matter of fact, some of the most generous people that I've known are very wealthy people. They, you know, God has blessed them with more and more. And I notice that the more that God blesses, then they're giving. They're giving of of themselves or giving of what God has blessed them with and God continues to bless them with more. And so uh, I do want to uh, emphasize that point and I have known people who are of the lower class that you know, I just have that insatiable greedy attitude that I've never seen. So, so it's not like it's you know that the poor people or, or the people of the lower class, class are generous and people who are wealthy are, are all greedy. That's not the case. I think it's, it's something that, that goes throughout the whole you know, throughout all of the, the different social statuses. But I, I do think that for everybody, we are all humans. It's because we're all humans. You can say, oh, yeah, you know, I was born on Baltic Avenue, and so, you know, the cards were not in my favor to begin with. Or, boy, I was born on Park Place. How wonderful it was for me. You know, so, but the thing that we are all humans. And so, the thing of it is, is that whether we have a little or a lot, we can be generous people. And it isn't always with our finances either. Sometimes it can be with our abilities to be able to help somebody, with our time to be able to help somebody, to be a friend to somebody. You know, a lot of our generosity are things that don't cost a dime. How many lonely people? To give some time to go out and visit somebody who's lonely. Or to say that, yeah, we can't afford this, but maybe together we can and we can make this a neighborhood effort or a community effort. You know, so there are different ways that we can look at how can generosity, how can you know, God's presence in us, where God provides enough that we can make it through a day. And that's another thing is always knowing what our needs versus wants. And if we were to make a list, okay, I, these are all the things that I want and these are all the things that I need, and make a line to say, well, yeah, I really would want this. Not to say that you couldn't save up for it, but... But really what we need today is this, and that we focus on it. I knew this man who helped support me in seminary one year. Very generous man. And so I went and I, I visited with him. And so what he did is he took me downtown to this place, this, well, this cafe. 
this cafe that he would like to go to. And so as we were seating, I happened to notice that the few waitresses were all kind of almost jostling with each other as far as who's going to wait on our table. And I kind of thought, this is kind of odd. And finally, this one waitress kind of won out. And this man, this generous man, he was, well, he was communicating back and forth, having conversation with the waitress. Well, we got our meal, we ate our meal, had good conversation. But as we were leaving, well, then I understood. Now, here again, our meal, we just had like a basic lunch meal, like a ham, yeah, a hamburger is what I had, and, you know, soda pop and some french fries. And he had, I think, pretty much the same, I think, a bowl of soup. It probably didn't, back then, it didn't add up to be a whole lot. I mean, this would have been back in the 80s. So maybe it added up to a whole $7 back then. But what I noticed is that he laid down a $100 tip. And that's what I got the sense, is that this isn't the first time that he's done this in this cafe, and that's why all the waitresses want to wait on him. And so I think about how awesome that is, where a waitress who's a servant in the community and how much she could use that $100. I'm sure it really helped her and, and her family situation. But, but the point being is that this man, who obviously was very wealthy, but he was also very generous. And so I'm going to share a story about a wealthy person in the Bible. His name is Ahab and his wife Jezebel. They are, well, king and queen of, Is yeah, of Israel. And so I'll read from 1 Kings chapter 21. The other main character of this story would be a man by the name of Naboth. And so I'll read uh, 1 Kings chapter 21, uh, verses... 1 through 10. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the place of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, Let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it is a place, so, since it is uh, close to my place. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or, if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. But Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my father. So Ahab went home sullen and angry, because Naboth, the Jezreelite, had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. He lay on his bed, sulking, and refused to eat. His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, Why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? He answered her, Because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, Sell me your vineyard, or, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said, Is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters to Ahab, in Ahab's name, placed a seal on it, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in the prominent place among the people. But seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them testify that he has cursed both God and the king, then take him out and stone him to death. Well, here again, this, the story goes on, and that's actually what happened. I mean, this is really a tragic story. King Ahab goes down in history as probably being the worst king of Israel, and Queen Jezebel is considered to be like the most evil witch that's ever existed. It just shows what greed will do. I mean, here, Naboth and, or excuse me, here, Ahab, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, they had everything. I mean, I can't tell you, you know, just how, I mean, they had acres and acres of land. And, and here in the middle of all of this, you got Naboth, who had just a, well, just a little vineyard. 
And so if Ahab's land wasn't enough, he now wanted Nabal's vineyard as well. Well, he did offer Nabal, I will buy your property or I will give you something that's even better somewhere else. But sometimes we have to understand that with land, that it is more than just a dollar value. That with a lot of people, land is that the roots go very deep as far as your heritage, your family, your lineage. I mean, it's like this land that I have. You have to understand, this is where my father and mother, my grandparents, I mean, their blood, sweat, and tears are, have nurtured and have fertilized this land for, for generations now. And so in other words, there is no price tag on this land. This land is far more, value, far more valuable to me than any worldly price tag. Well, so King Ahab was sulking around and, and Queen Jezebel just says, well, come on, what's wrong with you? Act like a man, act like a king. And so then they plotted to have this they lied about uh, Naboth and had him stoned to death, and, and so the story goes. But for Jezebel and Ahab, you know, their lives, it didn't end well either. And so that's the thing about what we're seeing, is that there's only so much land in this world. And that's one of those things that we can really have greed over, is more and more land. And the way that God designed it is that there's enough land for everybody. You know, just, I think this is kind of the way that it is almost everywhere, but I know growing up in a, in a small town that basically existed for the dairy farmers, I couldn't tell you, it was probably 60 to, 40 to 60 dairy farmers around that little town. And that little town serviced the dairy farmers, but now I go there and there's maybe just, you know, a few dairy farms now, and, and they have, their mega farms. They have so, matter of fact, I think those farms are now milking more cows than what all the other 40 to 60 farms used to milk. And so these other farmers, you know, they used to all be able to live out on the land. They used to be able to make a living. And in fact, most of my friends, you know, grew up on these farms. You know, they worked hard. They made a living at it. They, were, they felt good about, about their way of life. And so farming for them, it wasn't just a job. It was a way of life. And, well, now these farms that in some cases have been in in the family for generations now have been sold and, and the farmers now go and you know, work in factories and other places, not to say that they aren't doing well making a good living, but their attachment is with that farm, that land that even though they sold it, doesn't have the, I mean, here again, the, the land is priceless. And there's always grief every time the farmer goes by the land saying, well, that used to be my life. That's where my life is to be. But we see that with small businesses, you know, the downtown merchant that used to be able to serve the community well and made a modest living and you know, now has all been swallowed up by the, the larger conglomerates. And so here again, we see that you know, this is what greed can do. And so what I'd say is that you know, as we live our lives is that first of all, that we be thankful for what we do have. To say, Lord, it may not be much, but I'm thankful for it. And what I have, I also want to share. And so, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Create in me a generous heart by your Holy Spirit. And as we do that, we share. And as we share, we feel, you know, very good about ourselves. And so, no, we're not complaining, but rather we are thankful. We're not greedy, but rather we are generous. And to say, well, yeah, if I had my neighbor's farm or if I had my neighbor's business, I'm sure I'd be making a lot more money and I probably can have a lot of extra money for all the toys and the trips or whatever it is that we're looking for. But to say, no, my neighbor and his family and his and her family, um, that they too can live out here on the land. And, and that's very important uh, to me as it is important hopefully for our whole neighborhood that we watch out for each other, that as one is struggling, what can the rest of us do to say, well, we're gonna help you during this tough time, we're all gonna weather this storm together, and we will make it, we will make it together. But we gotta hang together, but if you got a greedy attitude in there, uh, forget that. 
I knew a man who was retired and now pretty much you know, homebound, he and his wife, and I would call on them and bring them communion. And he had a car dealership in town. And so as I pull up my vehicle, he was the Ford dealer in town. He started the Ford dealership. But I had a, a Ram, and I was sitting right there in the front of, in the front there, I had a park. And so as we sat there with our big picture window, there was my Dodge car, and I thought, oh, that, oh I wish I would have parked around the corner, or, or I wish I could quickly go and pull the drapes so we can't see it. And so finally I just said to him, I'm sorry, but uh, somehow I got driving this Dodge. And he said, no. He said, Dodges are good. And I kind of looked at him funny, like, well, this is your rival. I mean, you've been a Ford dealer, and, and now you're saying that Dodges are good? And I started thinking, and it's kind of slipped out. I said, my other vehicle is a Chevrolet. And he said, no. He said, Chevrolets are good. I kind of looked at him again. And finally, I realized, yeah, he was a Ford dealer and certainly wanting to encourage as many customers to come into his Ford dealership. But one thing that I noticed about him is that he recognized that there's more people in this community trying to make a living than just himself. And so he would not say anything ill about his competitors saying that, no, I can make a living here selling my Ford cars, but it's okay for these other people to be making a living selling their, you know, their Dodges and also their Chevrolets. And I thought, you know, that's what a community spirit needs to be. Where we are all recognizing that we can be generous, that we can all live in the land. And so we pray for the Holy Spirit to transform our hearts so that we can have an attitude of generosity. And that brings joy to our lives. And I always think of the joy principle as being this. J stands for Jesus. Jesus first. And then the O, others second. And then the Y, yourself. If we can keep that perspective, then we know that we will be generous. And if everybody's generous, then that generosity just comp compounds on itself. And then we will be, have a community, we will have a church that is joyous. That we always want to give first fruits a percentage of what God has first given us. Given it to the Lord for his purposes and his work. You have been watching to Know Christ with Rev. Jeff Peterson, pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. For a donation of $15 or more, you can receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, Sharing Our Faith. Thank you for watching and tune in again next week for To Know Christ.